transfer. So uh, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to run out and phone call. Um, yeah, so that'll be up to this part. So I'm not sure what the screen is, I'll head down there. But I will continue. Well, I encourage this one to be Okay. It's an honor to introduce our final speaker, Laura Andriotti. Uh, well above my threshold, so she's not exactly to be in biomedical engineering at the University of Minnesota, part of the Cedar Group. Uh, she has postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Texas and also the University of Cedar. Uh, before her current appointment at NYU, she held several other appointments as a professor, first at the University of Mississippi, then at Washington University, St. Louis, uh, and then at Baylor College, College of Medicine, with a joint appointment at Rice University. She's published papers in Nature and in all the major neuroscience journals, uh, including many papers in the uh, Journal of Neurophysiology, Journal of Neuroscience, Neuron, Nature Neuroscience, Princeton and Neurobiology, and Cerebral Cortex. She's won many awards in her research. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and past editor in chief of the Journal of Neuroscience. Dr. Ayrbrocki's early work has been some of the particular difference. Uh, for example, she showed how the brain clearly distinguishes uh, the direction of gravity using object sensors that are equally sensitive to translational acceleration. As best known for the research on multisensory integration for the classification of uh, visual and acute web sensor uh, She has a legendary collaboration with Ed Lenko and Ed Parker, spanning over 100 years. Uh, much of her work is involved uh, in the cell recording and attack function. Her work uh, also often incorporates models as well as experimental data. Uh, for example, one of her well known papers showed that a specific normalization model accounted for a wide range of multisensory integration phenomena. Including the weighting of lethality according to reliability, which uh, by the way, she also demonstrated in her uh, Her recent work has translated uh, into mice as well as primates, and she's developing a broader view of navigation, encompassing uh, hippocampal adjustations in human moving monkeys, biosensory evidence accumulation in naturalistic sciences, which is what we will discuss now, as well as the hands that are just. <laughs> Can you hear me? Does this, does the microphone work? Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, my first time here, so it's fun. So what, um, and thank you for staying until the last, uh, the last talk. So I'm going to switch from uh, computation and human work to primate, to monkey work uh, and neuroscience, deep into neuroscience. So what, um, what I'm going to, my goal is to tell you what uh, my lab is doing, but also justify why we are doing what we are doing uh, right now. And I want to start with a little perspective in neuroscience. Above a certain age, you are allowed to do this. Um, so I've spent, I got my PhD in 91, so I've spent 35 years in neuroscience. And I went through the times where neuroscience was very different. And uh, a few years ago, I looked back at what I had done in my work, and I, had, I started really critiquing it and getting ready to do something slightly different. And let me explain to you why. So you probably all are familiar with this very famous task in Manchis. Uh, it's a two alternative first choice task. Many years ago, pioneering work in Bill Newsom's lab um, trained monkeys to do a perceptual discrimination task. Uh, monkeys were fixating, a visual stimulus was presented, uh, and uh, then um, uh, the animal was uh, forbidden from doing anything during the um, stimulus presentation. And then at the end of the stimulus, two targets appear, and then the animal had to do an eye movement to one or the other target um, to report his perceived direction of motion. So at the time, this was really pioneering. And at that time, we had no other choice but to do experiments like this, which 
were very specifically studying one part, and this is visual perception, in the absence of any other disturbances. And the reason we had to do this was because we were recording from one neuron at a time, and there was no other way to really make sense of what um, the brain may be doing other than averaging across many, many different repetitions uh, to be able to see what this cell was doing at that particular time. So this um, type of task has been very influential uh, in the field, particularly in, uh, in the monkey field, even though, of course, recently, many people trained in the monkey perceptual decision um, uh, field have actually moved to the rodent and they do similar tasks also in the rodent. In fact, in my previous work with Greg DeAngelis, we did quite a bit of this. Let me see if you can see my mouse. Yeah. So we did uh, also similar type of task design. In fact, all my multi-sensory work was done using two alternative first choice tasks. But I started really um, uh, thinking about this type of tasks um, more critically for many reasons. And I want to share some of these reasons. So first of all, you will all agree that these types of tasks are not ecologically relevant. In fact, in real life, we almost never experience a passive stimulus while doing nothing and then having to make a single decision at the end of this passive stimulus. Um, this idea to restrict the motor output, again, was done for good reasons 40, 50 years ago, but um, it's really against principles of ecological psychology and ethology. And uh, of course, to do these experiments, we had to overtrain our animals. Uh, we train our animals for months, for months, of months, and then we have to use exactly the same stimulus every time. In fact, if we change something small in the stimulus, the animal freaks out. And that's because these type of behaviors, because they are very unnatural, um, they are not generalizable or uh, flexible. So what's the alternative? Well, so at the far extreme, um, there is a field of neuroscience and psychology who, that really believes that the brain is for action. And the way we understand the world is defined by what we can do in it. And uh, of course, uh, this can go into, more, uh, um, into uh, more the ideas of gypsum, talking about affordances. Um, and in fact, um, uh, recently, uh, there has been um, evidence in the mouse while imaging the whole cortex that motor signals are really everywhere. And it has been a surprising result. Why are motor signals everywhere? And again, perhaps these motor signals are there because this motor planning is part of really uh, um, uh, etho ethological and ecological um, uh, behavior. So um, in my lab, I have really um, started changing what I do. I still have to train the animals and you will see what we do. Uh, but particularly now that neuroscience, that we have the technical ability to record from many cells at the same time, and we can analyze the population activity, the field really needs to move forward uh, 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 beyond these um, more um, traditional um, tasks. So what are, I call them nat natural behavior or naturalistic tasks, and everybody means a different thing by that word. So I want to define what are the important ingredients that I think are necessary uh, as the minimum requirement to understand the real brain as opposed to a laboratory brain. And the first is that we need to close the loop between perception and action. So in the real world, the sensory input is not really passive. We interact with the world and we manipulate that sensory input. That sensory input then is processed in, uh, from the, uh, by the brain to generate an internal belief. This internal belief leads to decisions and then actions. And then, of course, these actions 
change the sensory input that, um, that we receive. And so this ability for a task in the laboratory to really use active sampling has become, in my opinion, um, in my lab, a necessary requirement. Of course, um, the task needs to, cons to also include uncertainty as well as temporal dynamics because actions affect the future and useful properties of the world change all the time. Finally, I really would like to have a task in the lab that allows me to study flexibility and generalization. As I told you uh, previously, in these traditional um, neuroscience tasks, we cannot change anything without retraining the animal. So um, uh, I, I would hope to have a task that, of course, I have to train the animal to do. But then after that initial training, I would like to have the ability to study the flexibility of behavior, which I consider of co one of the most important aspects of uh, intelligence. So what do we do really in the lab? So we have moved all the way to freely, to freely moving macaques. So we have set up wireless recordings um, in uh, the, the animal is in a freely moving arena uh, and we can measure neural activity and um, uh, eye, head and body movements wirelessly. And at the same time, in a more um, conservative but uh, um, uh, or careful way, if you want to think about uh, it that way, we also do foraging experiments in virtual reality. And uh, uh, this is actually one of the things that I'm going to describe to you today. But I have a, a video of the freely moving arena just to show, I hope this plays. Uh, Maybe it doesn't play. This is too bad. This you could see a, a, an animal um, really freely moving uh, in the environment. Uh, by the way, animals love to go to the lab when it is to do this type of experiments. In fact, you have a hard time getting them out of this arena. Um, and in terms of so the, the main task we are training the animals to do is to it's a foraging task with three sources of food. Um, which uh, vary in probability of reward, uh, but at the same time, uh, the uh, probability of, of reward is also reflected in the color that is uh, in the um, uh, visual stimulus in front of it. Um, this, is not going to what, this is not what I'm going to tell you today because this is still work in, in the early stages, other than to tell you that it's so easy to train an animal to do this task. In fact, the, the most recent animal, uh, my graduate student trained, he had them, he brought him to the lab, he had them sit outside uh, the arena, and he watched another animal do the foraging task. And then a few days later, uh, my student put the new animal into the arena, and he started doing the task right away. So social learning, uh, and uh, again, um, um, really fun to do these experiments. And we are measuring wireless, as I told you before. So the theoretical framework that we use um, is um, um, we are trying at the same time to develop the theoretical framework to understand the behavior at its, uh, uh, the natural behavior. Uh, and we still try to use uh, some form of normative uh, framework ra rather than um, bottom-up um, uh, data science. So I collaborate with uh, Zach Pitko from uh, uh, Baylor and Rice. Um, and uh, really, we try to understand these behaviors using reinforcement learning models. But really, we cannot assume, because we vary the uh, sensory experience of the animal, we cannot assume that the perception of the animal is veridical about the outside world. So actually, we have to use something like inverse reinforcement learning to um, fit the behavior and generate beliefs about how the animal perceives the world. And then once we have these beliefs, we can um, align our uh, uh, population analysis to explore the neural basis of these beliefs. So let me 
give you an example of these experiments by uh, really talking to you about the easy version, the virtual reality version. And again, technology has improved quite a bit uh, in recent years. So uh, in the past, we used to have very massive projectors and screen and motion platforms. Uh, now we really have taken the virtual reality goggles from humans. We have changed the optics. And then uh, we put the animal uh, on the chair with the goggles in front. And so the simplest version of the task that we have trained monkeys to do so far is a very simple um, perceptual decision, very similar to this random dot uh, motion task that I and others have used in the past. But in this case, we have really closed the loop between perception and action. So specifically, the animal has a joystick. And of course, he has to learn to use the joystick. And he navigates in this virtual world uh, using uh, optic flow. And then there is a target that flashes and then disappears. And using the joystick, the animal moves in virtual space. And he has to stop at the memorized location of the target um, to get reward. So it is a very, very simple uh, task, but it still has the requirements, the three requirements I told you previously. And most importantly, it really has this action perception loop uh, property. And this is just an example of, the, of, the, of what the animal sees in front of, uh, on the screen in front of him. The circle is the target here when it flashes. And then the triangles are the optic flow elements. The reason they flash is because for these experiments, we actually wanted to study uh, self-motion integration. Uh, if they were not flashing, then the animal will use position landmarks to navigate. But we wanted them really to process velocity because we wanted to study sensory evidence accumulation. And uh, I think I have actually another video um, uh, with the, from the mouse this time, from the uh, uh, monkeys uh, this time, if I can move the mouse to the screen, um, such that uh, you can see. Yeah, unfortunately, the vid this video does not play anyway. It, it's the same thing. Oh, now it plays. You can see the optic flow really move uh, at, as he's moving the joystick, just to appreciate that all this uh, movement and all this visual stimulus comes from the animal's own actions. So this is an outline of what I'm going to show you today. Well, before I tell you that, uh, let me tell you what uh, um, this task involves, even though it is still a very, very simple task. It involves more than just sensory perception. So it involves short-term memory. Of course, the animal has to memorize the location of the target. Then it involves visual perception. Uh, the animal has to infer uh, his uh, self-position in the virtual world um, using uh, by integrating optic flow. In fact, this process of integrating self-motion velocity is known as path integration. And uh, in fact, there is a latent variable, um, and that is the distance to target. Latent variable means this is something that is not computed by the sensory periphery. This is something that the brain has to compute and is task um, uh, specific. So in this case, for the animal to know when to stop, he really needs to, at every moment in time, uh, measure his distance from the memorized location of the target. But in addition to these things, um, the task includes action. Um, we teach our uh, animals how to drive, how to use the joystick. It involves internal models because they uh, uh, develop them as they get exposed to this task over and over. And importantly, we can study the interactions between um, sensory-based beliefs and memorized internal models, trial by trial. And of course, it's sequential decision making task with um, active sensing. And as I told you, it's modeled using um, reinforcement learning 
uh, guided by uncertain beliefs. So how do we measure? Um, uh, the uh, joystick has two degrees of freedom. Um, so linear velocity and angular velocity. So pushing the uh, joystick front back, that corresponds to linear velocity. And moving the joystick left right, that corresponds to angular velocity. And this is a typical behavioral um, uh, uh, data that we get for each uh, firefly flash. So the uh, target flashes in this period, then disappears, then the animal moves the joystick until it stops. And this is the trajectory corresponding to this um, uh, motion profile. And uh, of course, as you can imagine, uh, if the trajectory brings the animal very close to the original location of the target, then the animal is rewarded. If um, the animal stops far away from the target, then that's an unrewarded trial. And uh, on, uh, this is a typical session. Uh, on each um, uh, trial, there is one firefly that flashes, but uh, this firefly is uh, chosen from um, uh, distribution. And this is a typical trajectory uh, that uh, the, an animal follows um, when these fireflies are flashed. So very simple uh, behavior. And this is what I'm going to tell you. So first, I am going to tell you that the third requirement uh, for the reason we did these experiments, which is uh, uh, we were initially hoping that once we train an animal how to drive, then he can drive in any different uh, um, uh, circumstance. The same way we learn how to drive, and then we can generalize this behavior in multiple settings. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is that even though we train the animal in this very simple version of the task, the animal without additional training can really generalize this behavior as long as the rule is to use the joystick to navigate in the virtual world. The second thing I'm going to tell you is a surprising result that we uh, really um, found in the behavior. Originally, this task had nothing to do with eye movements. In fact, I never thought when I started these experiments, I was measuring, I was studying eye movements. But as I will show you, eye movements are an important part of solving the task. And that's because we allow the animal to do active sensing, active sampling, and express its motor, um, uh, its motor system the way it wants to. And then finally, I'm going to show you some uh, uh, neural analysis, uh, but uh, this will be really only at the end of my talk. OK, so let's start from the first uh, requirement. So uh, I told you that there were three important ingredients in the task that I wanted to study in, uh, now in the lab. One is active sense, active sampling. The second is uncertainty, of course, and dynamic um, uh, stimuli. And the third was a task that the animal can really generalize beyond what he was trained to do. And so this is what I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to, share, to show you a few examples of the uh, expansions in the basic task that the animal was trained to do, um, to show you, to tell you that in a naturalistic task like this, uh, where, yes, the animal has to learn how to use the joystick, but beyond that, he really can capitalize on what he has learned through development and evolution. He knows the integral of velocity is position. He knows this is still a navigation task. So it, it really um, uh, uses uh, schemas that are well developed uh, and used uh, in his brain. So one of the um, first manipulations we, uh, we did and that was actually important in order to characterize um, uh, the brain in a task where there is an action perception loop, is really the ability to be able to manipulate each of these three components and while the animal was still doing the task without problem. So we manipulated the sensor input by changing the density of the optic flow or we, by adding noise in the optic flow. 
We manipulate the motor output by changing the gain of the joystick or the dynamics of the joystick. And then, very importantly, we can manipulate the latent state, which is the um, position of the animal relative to the goal location, by randomly adding passive optic flow perturbation. So suddenly we displace the animal forward, back or left or right, uh, and we see how the animal's brain want, uh, respond under these cases. So that was the goal, but uh, of course we first needed to make sure that his behavior can generalize. So I'm going to show you just the motor output result. Um, so this is, so the animal was trained um, only with a single joystick gain, and then uh, suddenly, we change the gain of the joystick. And here, what I'm plotting is the absolute error as a function for each, for four different uh, animals. And orange is what the error would have been if the animal did not adjust uh, the joystick and uh, the, uh, the, uh, did not adjust his beliefs. And the data, the blue and black data, show the trials after the uh, game change was implemented. And the light blue is the first trial, the dark blue trial two, and so on. So I want you to see that even from the first trial, the animals can really adjust um, uh, their uh, steering to reflect the altered gain of the joystick. And since these original experiments, as I told you, we actually now vary the dynamics of the joystick from position of the joystick corresponding to velocity or to acceleration. And we do this trial by trial, and the animal can, um, can do this task without a problem. So we started, we were decided to study, to test moving fireflies. So in all the previous training, the flashing firefly was always stationary. So we were curious, what happens now if we start having uh, the firefly move in a predictable way, of course. So in this uh, data I'm going to show you, it's um, uh, constant velocity. So basically, during the flash, this is the beginning of the target flash. This is the end of the target flash. This is where the uh, position of the animal is uh, during the target presentation, uh, beginning and end. And then, as you can see, the animal can detect this velocity and adjust its trajectory to really end up uh, at the correct location of the target without ever having seen uh, a moving firefly. We also expose the animal to two fireflies. I, again, monkey doesn't blink an eye. He does the task as long as the fireflies are of the same reward. He, of course, will choose the firefly that is closest to the animal. In fact, we can generate nice psychometric functions um, as a fun function of the angular uh, difference or the radial uh, uh, difference. And we can even uh, manipulate the value of the firefly by uh, changing its color. And again, the animal can do this task right away from the first trial. Finally, and that was the ultimate uh, goal we had, was actually to, to simulate a true firefly in the woods experience, where there are now not one firefly at a time, but basically, stochastically, there is a, a group of fireflies. Each turns on and off stochastically. They have different velocities. And um, uh, again, the animal is able to do this task without a problem. So we have achieved <clears throat> the ability to, to really train the animal in a restricted, simple version of the task, but then allow us to study it under different conditions to uh, uh, allow us to study flexibility in the brain. So now I'm going to tell you about the eye movements, which is probably, um, even though it makes sense once I give you the results, uh, nevertheless, this was something that we did not really uh, appreciate when we started these experiments. So this is the uh, steering behavior I showed to you previously. And so we were measuring the eyes, the movement of the eyes, even though we had no idea they would be useful. 
So when we plotted the horizontal and vertical eye position uh, for this is four different firefly flashes, the gray vertical lines is a different firefly flashing. As you can see, the firefly was different, but the uh, movement of the eyes were quite stereotypical. So immediately after the flash, there was a saccade, a reflexive saccade to the uh, location of the target. But then the eyes did not move away, but actually followed relatively smooth trajectories. And these trajectories uh, brought the eyes to the center horizontally and downward vertically, which is exactly where the target would have been if it was visible. And you can see this uh, in, uh, uh, this is like uh, eye movements for the whole, uh, from the whole session. So what happens indeed is that even though the target is extinguished, the animal tends to look to the memorized location of the target uh, throughout the trial. And we can quantify this uh, by measuring what we call the target tracking index, which varies from uh, chance level to one. Uh, one is really exactly looking at the target. So as you can see, of course, when the target disappears, um, that uh, target tracking index is high. Uh, it reduces but remains above chance uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the trial. And we verified this in humans just to make sure that this was not something peculiar uh, we did with, uh, with our animals. So the conclusion is that indeed humans and monkeys tend to look at the memorized location of the, of the target. And so we hypothesize that perhaps actually this, the ability to keep our eyes on the target makes our steering easier. And so the first analysis we did was to separate the, the monkey data, uh, the target tracking uh, uh, data into uh, two groups, uh, trials where steering was accurate and the animal was rewarded, and steering that was not accurate and the animal was not rewarded. And as you can see, uh, the more, the better the animal struck the target, the, the more accurate the behavior, the steering behavior was. And uh, we also verified this in the human experiments. Um, by asking humans to fixate, and when humans fixated, then their steering accuracy um, uh, got reduced. So what these results suggest is that uh, eye movements without um, uh, us requiring them to do so, uh, eye movements naturally tend to track the goal location even when no target is, um, is visible. And so we had two ideas, two hypotheses as to why this could be the case. Because this was a visual task, one possibility which I find the least exciting is that somehow by looking where you are going makes the, visual, the task of the visual system easier. So maybe he can really um, uh, process the optic flow better by looking uh, where his goal is. The second hypothesis, which is really more provocative, is that uh, the eyes keep looking at the goal location as a form of embodied memory. Uh, so by keeping your eyes, by having your whole oculomotor system encode the, lo the location of the target, working memory is facilitated. And so to separate between these two possibilities, uh, we took advantage of the fact that we can do these experiments in a multi-sensory way. So these are now data, what I'm going to, to show you is data from humans. Uh, so we have these motion platforms. This is how we study visual vestibular interactions. They're like flight simulators. Um, so we wanted to, uh, to do the same task but now without optic flow, just using uh, inertial cues. So for this, we had the movement of the joystick update, not the visual stimulus, 
but rather the motion platform. It takes a little bit of engineering, but it's possible to do this. Uh, however, we couldn't do it the original way because there is no way you can move. The original way the joystick was in velocity control, which means the position of the joystick corresponded to velocity, to self-motion velocity. You cannot do this when you actually move the subject because there is no movement that can have infinite acceleration. So this is when we needed to change the dynamics of the joystick. Uh, and so we need to really uh, work between velocity and acceleration um, uh, to do these experiments. But nevertheless, the take home message is that when we uh, asked humans to do this task, we found that uh, subjects were doing um, were moving their eyes the, uh, in a similar way, not only in the uh, visual condition, but also in the vestibular condition. So in the absence of any optic flow, this was actually total darkness after the target disappeared and the animal really moved through the world using um, uh, the joystick to control his uh, acceleration. Uh, even under these conditions, the eyes tend to look at the memorized location of the target, which uh, makes us uh, uh, conclude that uh, uh, the presence of these eye movements are at, at least partly, maybe completely, due to the fact that they may represent memory embodiment. So we could do one more thing. Um, it turns out it's not easy to, to use uh, without optic flow to navigate. You can imagine this. Uh, so uh, subjects made uh, big errors. And in fact, we didn't give feedback. So they ended up stopping uh, in a location that could be far away from the original location of the target. Um, so then we could do the following analysis. We could um, regress. We could see whether the eye movement was related to the original location of the target or the final location where the subject stopped. If uh, we assume that the subject stopped at a location that they thought was the correct location, right? So uh, working memory is weak, the processing of uh, integration of self-motion signals is not perfect, so they made mistakes, but we thought that that was their best belief of where the target was. So we regressed um, the eye movement as a function of target position, the original target position, and as a function of the stop position. And as you can see early on, um, the correlation with the original target position was high, but then gra that gradually got reduced. And then ultimately, at the end of the trial, the correlation was very strong with the stop position, reflecting that actually the eye movements um, reflect the internal belief of the latent variable. So remember, for the subjects to do the task, they need to keep track of their location relative to the goal. Of course, their goal may be uh, not the veridical uh, goal, but nevertheless, their eyes seem to be following that perceived, that belief, uh, that belief where the, they should be stopping. OK, so if I were to summarize what I told you so far, we found from this um, very simple experiment that gaze reflects uh, the reward goal. Um, and the subjective beliefs about uh, the latent variable. So we wanted to know whether this was a generic finding uh, or whether this was something peculiar to this very artificial optic flow stimulus. So a graduate student in a lab um, in humans um, decided to actually uh, uh, try to, to use real mazes, well, real uh, virtual reality mazes, and so this is what I'm going to show you now. So uh, he had um, uh, subjects um, uh, where uh, goggles and uh, there were uh, different types of mazes. 
Uh, the task was very similar. There was a banana that flashed, and then the subject had to navigate um, to reach um, and stop at the memorized location of the firefly. And uh, we had the um, uh, different complexities, uh, different arenas that varied from something very, very simple without obstacles, which this is similar to the firefly task, uh, to um, more and more complex arenas. Uh, where really there was very hard to really plan the, uh, the path. And so the subjects could do this very well. In fact, they chose the, um, the minimum uh, path length. And I, I will only give you one result of these studies, the most relevant result. Um, but to do so, let me tell you that we separated um, each uh, trial into three epochs. So first, uh, the subjects needed to foveate uh, the target because they could rotate uh, 360 degrees around. Um, then there was a delay uh, between, uh, we knew where they foveated it because we could see where the eyes were looking. Then there was a delay that we call pre-movement. So it was the period where the, animal, the subject was planning. And then of course there was the movement period and they all depend in, on uh, arena com um, complexity. So what happened to the eye movements? And this is the summary that I want you to uh, have as a take home message. There are two things I want you to notice here. Um, uh, so these plots uh, shown separately for the pre-movement and the movement period show the fraction of time that the eyes looked at the target and the fraction of time that the eyes looked at the trajectory that the subjects ultimately chose. And uh, the gray is uh, anything other than the target or the trajectory. So two conclusions. First is that um, uh, the, uh, the subjects tended to look at the target, similarly as in the firefly task. So this appears to be a generic uh, finding. However, uh, and particularly for more complex arenas, the subjects also tended to look along the trajectory that they would ultimately chose. And they did this not just during the movement period, but also during the planning pre-movement period. And only less than 20% of the time of the eye movements were at other locations. And in fact, what the subjects did during this 20% of the time is that they were deliberating. They were looking at other locations, seeing whether the path was uh, better. So what this data suggests is that there is a trade-off between gathering information about the different the relevant aspects of the environment and also looking at the memorized goal location. And um, uh, in fact, uh, I can show you exactly what the subjects did if this video plays, um, because you can, yes, it plays, so that's good. So the eyes is this diamond, the red diamond. This is where the subject starts, and this is where the goal was, and this is going to play multiple times so you can, you can actually see what happens. So this is the start, the eyes search, find the goal, then they keep looking back and forth along the trajectory that they will ultimately follow. And then even during the movement, they keep looking back and forth along the trajectory and at the goal. And we can quantify this by projecting the um, uh, eye movements into the, we linearize the trajectory and we projected the eye movement onto it. Zero is the start location, and one is the goal location. And what you can see is that the, su the subjects used to, um, tended to use saccadic sequences to look along the trajectory in both the forward and backward um, direction. And in fact, uh, backward sweeps were more uh, common during pre-movement, and forward sweeps are more common um, during the movement. So I want to pause for a second and tell you that these saccadic sequence happen at a, at a very fast time scale. 
and they remind us so much of the hippocampal replay. How many people know about hippocampal replay? So um, activity play cells in the hippocampus um, during decision points uh, uh, when uh, they are stationary, but also through theta sequences when they navigate, they have this temporal activation at a very fast um, millisecond, uh, 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 very fast uh, theta se uh, sequence time scales. Uh, which resemble very much uh, this pattern of, uh, of sweeps. So where are we now and what, is, what does all of this mean? So uh, I, am, I have never studied the hippocampus before. Uh, this is a new direction for me. I am naive into this field and naive means I can be stupid and they can excuse me. Um, so one of the things, so the way we think about what these eye movements may be doing is when we, um, we can think of uh, in a novel environment versus a familiar environment, we can think of subjects, uh, something from memory or something from the world. And of course, at the extremes, we can sample from memory in familiar environments or we can sample from the world in uh, uh, novel environments, but in most uh, everyday scenarios, we do both. And I was very surprised to uh, trying to read the literature in the field that they all talk about, um, about uh, memory uh, retrieval and memory consolidation, but really they don't really consider that it's a continuum where active something is part of the same process, we recall memories, we update them with uh, something in the world, and maybe eye movements really reflect the interaction of the two. And most importantly, if I look at the computational uh, uh, neuroscience, and maybe I've missed some studies, so if you know of something, please tell me. But um, uh, there is a, a very nice uh, recent paper from uh, uh, Matar and O where they really use a reinforcement learning model to predict hippocampal replay uh, under the assumption uh, of maximizing reward. Of course, they don't do anything about, they don't think about eye movements. They only simulate neural replay. Uh, and of course, if we assume that the eye movements is a slave of memory, then we can at the same, uh, we can at the same time really uh, simulate our results. But there is the other extreme on the other side, and the, the connection has never been made, uh, that the idea that um, uh, you can also uh, drive, uh, you can also sample the world driven by curiosity. And the closest that I can think of is Carl Friston's work. And we, so far, these two fields are separated, but in fact, the two may be related. So this is work in progress. And uh, uh, we are getting ready to record from the hippocampal formation to try to see whether there is any relationship between um, using the eyes to explore the world and keep a memory of the target and neural, uh, neural replay. So um, uh, a summary so far, we've tried to use more naturalistic tasks and uh, in doing so, we've discovered that uh, al allowing the motor system free can really reveal strategies that uh, may have been missed in the past. And um, in fact, there may be a very tight link between the hippocampus and the oculomotor system that has not been um, considered seriously before. And maybe I should mention that work from Beth Buffalo's lab and my lab, recording from the hippocampus of monkeys, uh, has actually shown eye movement signals. Uh, so that's not surprising. It's just that nobody has ever linked them uh, to any particular function. And before the conclusion was, oh, they are just there because of attention or because we are visual animals. So this is where this is. So for the last, uh, 
a few minutes, I would like just to give you a sample about um, the neurons. And um, uh, again, I'm going to only show you analysis of the main simple single target firefly task. Uh, so this is the training task, but we had to start from this. And the um, reason we did this, uh, we use this task is because we wanted it to be a sensory decision, a perceptual decision um, task. Uh, we recorded from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, from the parietal area 7A, which is connected to the hippocampal formation. And then at the last minute, as an afterthought, I said, let's also record from uh, extra striated visual cortex, an area I had recorded many times in the past. And I thought this area was a control area. <coughs> and I will expect to see all of these higher level latent signals in the uh, parietal and frontal cortex, but not in MST. So this just shows uh, uh, typical recordings from the three areas. These are simultaneous recordings. And um, of course, each trial, because it corresponds to a different firefly and the animal can do whatever he wants, each trial has a different length. And the one thing I want to highlight is that um, there is no sustained activity. The whole field of Manchi physiology and recently rodent uh, uh, physiology studies perceptual decision making using these two alternative first choice tasks. And they study this delayed activity that they use drift diffusion models to fit. Uh, in contrast, using more natural navigation tasks in the past, uh, Chris Harvey and other mouse uh, labs that study na visually guided navigation had never found um, uh, sustained activity. Instead, they found sequential activity. So this is what we see. We see sequential activity, not at all this sustained activity, even though this is an evidence accumulation task, very similar to traditional decision, perceptual decision-making task. So how we can um, analyze this? Um, so we, um, we've used different ways to do it, but for now I'm only going to talk to you about the GAM model. So basically we fitted the spiking activity of the neurons using um, uh, this uh, function, which corresponds uh, tuning to different sensory, motor, and uh, latent variables and different temporal filters corresponding to reward and target flash and all of these things. But most importantly, it also contains a spike history filter, which has to do with the autocorrelation, how the, uh, the history of spiking in the same cell affects the future firing. And most importantly, coupling to the other simultaneously recorded uh, uh, neurons. So we fitted this equation, and I'm going to, um, it fits quite well. Uh, and I'm going to just show you a very busy diagram uh, where here it's the fraction of neurons tuned uh, in the different areas shown by color. And then we have separated them into sensory motor, latent, and then LFP, and then other like reward and eye movements. There are really two things that I, I want to emphasize. First, there are signals everywhere. And second, even though originally I thought that by recording from MST, that's the green, that will be the control area, an area that really does not code for latent uh, variables. As you can see here, a substantial proportion of uh, neurons in MST uh, uh, encodes the distance to target, which is the cognitive um, variable. So clearly in a much more naturalistic uh, um, task, um, which includes action perception loops, even sensory um, uh, areas may be involved in the processing of information. Um, so the other thing uh, that I want to tell you is that uh, we saw significant neuron to neuron coupling. So this shows the model log likelihood 
of how much the model fit improved when we included the spike history filter or the coupling filter, as opposed to when it, they were not included. And if you look at the uh, pink, you see that really the fitting of the model was substantially better if it included the coupling filter. So these are spike to spike coupling between different simultaneously recorded neurons within the same area and across areas. So um, this is work in progress. So the, there is uh, the last result I want to show you, just to tell you that the ability to record from many cells at the same time now will allow us to, particularly during naturalistic behaviors like this, uh, will allow us to understand, to explore things that we couldn't do in the past. So I am going to show you one of the manipulations we did, which was the manipulation of the sensor input. And we did this by changing the optic flow density. And the reason that we are interested in this is because when the uh, optic flow is weak, then the animal relies more on its internal model and less on the current sensory evidence. So by comparing the activity of the neurons in these two cases, we see how the, um, uh, the processing of, uh, uh, while we change the relative weighting of sensory versus internal model driven navigation. So uh, I will, there are only a few slides I want to show you. And um, uh, again, the different um, areas are in different colors. Uh, uh, for simplicity, let's only look at green and, um, and uh, red. So dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and MST. So this shows the cumulative distribution of how the coupling filter changed from low density to high density. This is the internal vari variability measured in the control block. And this is chance, the gray. And so what we saw is that higher cognitive areas changed much more than uh, sensory area MST. And in fact, there was a significant correlation between the rewarded, the relative fraction of rewarded trial between high density and low density, and uh, uh, the, uh, how much these coupling filters changed in these two areas. The more units in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex remap, the less behavior suffered from the less of sensory evidence. And exactly the reverse was true uh, for MST. So clearly, these coupling filters um, change when the uh, uh, parameters of the task uh, change. And we hypothesized that perhaps this had to do something with the population activity. So when we looked at a very simple PCA, uh, the composition of the population activity between the low density and the high density stimulus, we saw that in the cognitive areas, the population activity did not change, but of course in MST changed. And uh, in fact, we can also um, uh, uh, um, verify this by um, doing uh, uh, decoding. So we used either um, uh, high density uh, uh, decoding to train and then test the decoder, or low density to train and test, or high density to train and then low density to test. And the take home message is that it appeared that the action uh, the across the condition decoding, which is the most interesting, um, the uh, generalization of the population activity. Uh, was possible in the cognitive areas, uh, but not in MST. And in fact, there was a significant correlation uh, between this um, R square and the coupling uh, filter correlation. So let me summarize. So what these results suggest is that um, changes in the dynamics of these neural conflictuations in, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex may actually drive the stability in the population code in this area 
and um, uh, this is work that we will explore in the future. So let me summarize this last part. Um, we found strong interneuronal coupling, both within and across areas. And uh, in particular, when we change the relative weighting between sensory evidence and internal model, we saw that um, uh, the coupling filter correlations changed in both uh, cognitive areas and sensory areas, but they changed in different ways and they correlated with the behavior in different ways. And um, uh, so we, um, our results support the hypothesis that dynamic reconfiguration of uh, new, uh, neural coupling in uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex may support flexible behavior by rendering the population dynamics invariant to the changing sensory input. And if we want to be more provocative, one can also think about cognitive internal models that um, change um, fast on a fast time scale in the, in the brain may be housed in the precise connectivity within cortical areas like uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So I'm going to stop here. I'm sorry I bombarded you with a lot of information. So very important to uh, highlight the contribution of my collaborators. So Kaushik was my graduate student at Baylor. He uh, pioneered all the um, uh, Firefly uh, experiments. And he made the mistake to move um, for a postdoc. He is at the Theory Center at Columbia. And so that's very close to NYU. So he continues to, as you saw from his participation in many of the other projects, uh, he's getting ready to look for a job now. He's superb, a superb theorist. My uh, theory collaborator, Zach Pitko, uh, with whom uh, we try to model the behavior and then apply this analysis to the population activity. My data scientist collaboration, Christina Savin, and as you can imagine, to do this data analysis, uh, it's not uh, um, trivial. And uh, uh, sometimes we have to develop new tools to be able to analyze this. Uh, my long-term collaborator, Greg DeAngelis, with whom we have many publications, uh, as it was commented before, and then three postdocs who participated in these experiments. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, uh, no, um, hold on a second, no. It is three different neurons, one in each area, and each line is a different triangle. It's a it's a recurrent network, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is what it reminds us to, exactly that, yes. But it's very different. This, in its simple version, this is really a sensory evidence accumulation task. Um, and we have um, done all the analysis to show that the animal indeed integrates optic flow. And yet we, of course, don't see sustained activity yet. Everything we know so far about how the brain integrates sensory evidence to reach a decision is based on sustained activity in the monkey. Yeah, I think the, the one way of modeling Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So is that, is that a sort of model of success? Uh, 
So a model like this uh, can probably explain the data, but we have not really explicitly simulated, but I'm pretty sure that, uh, that it could. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it could. Uh, 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 Mehrad Jazeri, uh, Mehrad Jazeri's work. Uh, didn't he record from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? He studies time perception, um, but I don't remember from which areas he recorded from. If if it, if it was one of these areas. Yeah, so the torsolateral prefrontal cortex is not the part of the prefrontal cortex that interacts with the hippocampus, unfortunately. That part that interacts with the hippocampus is much harder to access uh, in the monkey brain. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we don't record from those cells. The one that I went very fast. <laughs> the correlations. So the first two is you expect to see it because uh, um, you. This is the cross-validated R square. And of course, you expect to see uh, this. What is surprising is that when we use one sensory condition um, to cross-validate, it worked uh, for uh, um, the cognitive areas um, because we, it appears that the population activity uh, remains invariant to the change in the sensory input. But of course, it doesn't work uh, for the um, MST because the population activity changed. Yeah. So this is still work in progress. This is not published. So this is just preliminary results supporting the idea that, that when we vary the relative weighting between internal model and sensory and current sensory evidence, um, the uh, sensory uh, areas uh, remap the population activity, change the population activity, but cognitive areas do not. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we have not done retracing. So all of this, so we don't do path integration and we don't do retracing really because so the target appears and you have to reach at the, tar the target location. In the Firefly task, any, any route they can take. We have tried to see whether the eye movements are reflexive or not. Uh, and we have investigated in my early life, I was studying eye movements for, uh, for a living. So I know about reflexive eye movements. So we have eliminated, these are not reflexive eye movements. These look like predictive pursuit. So there are two types when we follow targets. There are two types of um, eye movements. Uh, one is visually driven, but um, uh, once you follow a target, uh, you don't have any retinal error any longer. So we, the reason we can continue looking at the target is because the system that is what is known as predictive pursuit. So there is an integrator that keeps the eyes moving 
Um, and these look a lot like predictive uh, pursuit eye movements. So um, we are actually in the process now of we are stimulating electrically the uh, frontal eye fields, which is the motor area of, uh, of, the, uh, of the eye movement system. And we, because we try to perturb the system and see uh, whether uh, navigation is affected. We have not tested this. This is a good point. You mean change the task to make it more traditional uh, hippocampal task? Yeah, because the, the way it was done originally, it was not with the framework of hippocampus. It was based on the framework of uh, perceptual decision making. But you are absolutely right. We need to do it from the perspective of, uh, of, the, of the memory field. Let's talk during the, the food. Yes, I'm really interested. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. So and they occur in differential in different situations. We observe similar like DJ, it's forward and backward saccades, yes. Yeah. Backward replays after reward. Because the task, I mean, I really, I've, this is an important conclusion of today's experience that I need to change the task to study it more from that perspective. The, the task was not, so I don't know the answer, but they are so much like forward replay and backward replay. And reading the literature, um, the, first of all, you don't see reverse replay during sleep. Uh, you see on reverse replay in the hippocampus only only during uh, sharp uh, only awake sharp way uh, ripples, um, and they think that at least reading the literature, my conclusion is that the current thinking is that uh, it's the credit assignment uh, propagation. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah. And, and so it could very well be because the backward saccades go from the goal to where you start. And it, it, that can fit very well. But everybody thinks of these replays. Well, not everybody. There are on the passing some discussion about planning. But most people really think of it as memory retrieval. But so what's the relationship between planning and memory retrieval? And if you know of theoretical work on the topic, I would love to really um, uh, uh, read it because I cannot see a lot of, um, I, I cannot find the relevant literature um, for this. Yeah. So work in progress. Okay, thank you so much. Is there another question? Yeah. The food, let's go to the food. I did make a phone call and confirm. Who's not there yet? <laughs> No, no, the whole height in this, we've only done one, the experiment one way. So 
you could you look at it from the top and the, uh, you could see the you didn't need to have an internal model of the environment really because it was usable at all times because the target was not but so you could I mean one of the experiments we want to try to do also now is to lower the the subject into the Inside the wall, such that you don't have an internal model of the environment. You see how the animals then switch the tension and so on. So there are lots of different ways we can manipulate the target. But in these experiments, they were this popular. You could really see the animals. It's a bad idea. But the target was born. And the planning of the test site was not easy in a complex arena. And the subject did very, very well in always shortening the traffic time. And whenever they made mistakes, they made mistakes because they forgot to have a banana board, not because they chose the wrong path. So they could really plan very well, uh, except that they didn't remember exactly what the banana board. They don't need to, they don't need to, because each one, I don't think they require them, they just don't need to have an internal model of the environment because it's always there. So with these, they really need to have that also. Then perhaps there could be, what we saw in the animation pattern, we see them potentially quality different. One last question. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's a very good question. We don't know yet, yes. But it is, it is a, a property, it was it for a network property or a, 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 I, I don't know, but it's trial by trial. Yes. Thank you, everyone, again. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you all for coming to